Welcome back everybody to the Thrive Street Podcast, Mastering the Art of Thriving at Life, where we talk about creating change in our lives and in the world around us. And we were just cracking up because it took me three tries to get that right today. <laughs> that is a mouthful. I'm not sure. I might need to record that, you guys, and, and add it on later. Welcome back. If you guys are joining us uh, um, for the first time, welcome. If you guys are, have been listening uh, up, up until now, you might find today's a little bit different format. Um, we've got uh, myself, the host, JJ, and my co-host, or really, Gigi's the host, and I'm the co-host. Say hi, Gigi. Hi. And I must say, Gigi's hair does look amazing. I know she says that whenever she gets her hair done, everybody comments on it. And uh, um, yeah, so I, I did notice that. But uh, um, yeah, so so today for today's uh, um, uh, podcast, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about the the programming that I do, and we're going into one of my you know sort of trademark six week strength focuses. And so if you guys are listening, you guys might want to find this video on YouTube where I'm going to show some of these graphics. Um, um, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about it so you can so you can listen in. And then after that, we're gonna talk about this um, this great article that I found called like the death of the calorie, and it talks about kind of the history of the the ca calorie measurement and how. Um, and how it's become so entrenched. And when we talk about nutrition and when people are talking about calories, um, you know, where does it really come from? And so what are some of the, what are some of the um, uh, uh, limitations that come around when, when we're using the, the calorie? So that'll, that'll come up later on, but let's, let's jump into some of the, some of the programming and uh, um, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen and we'll start with, uh, we'll start with this one. So this is a um, this is kind of a, a, an overview of the six week strength focus. In that, uh, what I what I wanted to show was that every every six weeks we're focusing on one particular lift and a superset. And uh, there's a there's a bunch of reasons for this, but uh, basically what we found was when we were doing the more constantly varied type of program, the the uh, the problem we had is that people plateaued. They they wouldn't uh, if we only lifted once or twice a week or even three times per week, but the lifts were constantly changing everyone kind of hit a little bit of a stale stalemate because, because they weren't getting enough routine to continue to make gains at that like two, three, four uh, year mark or longer. And so um, what we started to do is kind of from, from what I knew about strength and conditioning practices and kind of studying people like Dan John, um, you know, we found that, 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 that if you can focus on a, a particular movement for, you know, you know, five, six, seven weeks, um, you can, you can make, continue to make progress even for more advanced people. And so we, we started testing this back, I think around 2010, um, and we've been doing it ever since and refining it. Um, but basically what we do is we, we'll do a test in the week before. So if you're looking at the graphic, <clears throat> you can see right around week five of the previous week, um, we'll, test, we'll test kind of to see where people are at. And it doesn't have to be a full max out type of, type of deal. Um, but we're just trying to see, you know, see where people are currently at. If they haven't done that lift in a long time, especially if they're a newer person, um, we want to get sort of an accurate measurement. And then, um, and then we'll start the six weeks. And at the beginning of the strength focus, we are going to, we are going to kind of give some recommended percentages. It's usually a range. So we'll start a lot of times in the 70 to 80% range, sometimes maybe a little bit higher, sometimes lower, depending on the movement. And then, uh, and then we're going to be either adding volume or we're going to be adding reps, right? So every workout after that, it's either going to be the same weight for more reps per set, or it's going to be, um, or eventually we'll get to a point where we'll do drop the reps and then, and then go up to the, uh, um, and then continue that way. So we'll see a couple of weight jumps over the, over the six weeks. Um, and, and then the, uh, the, but then one of the key things I wanted to point out was that, that everyone should know is that in the first two weeks, because the percentages are so light, this is the time to really focus on technique and form um, and kind of learning the movement and sort of fixing some of the issues that have been kind of nagging that movement. And then, um, and then we, but what, because we're going so light, what I tend to do is, is I actually increase the Metcon volume a little bit. So if you're someone who likes longer Metcons, um, and, and wants extra volume, those first two weeks, we're going to see more Metcon, we're going to see, we're going to see more volume. Then in the middle two weeks, we're going to see a, a kind of a balance between the two. So, so the, between the lifting and the Metcon. And then on the last two weeks, we tend to drop the, the Metcon volume a little bit so that, so that, uh, so that we can hit our numbers on our lifts. And, and, uh, and so that's, that's kind of, there's, there's the, 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 strength, the strength sort of intensity is going up over the six weeks and then the Metcon is going down. And it's not like it goes down to zero. We're still gonna, you know, on, a, on week six, we still may do a 20 minute Metcon, um, but they're gonna be more lifting days total. And, and uh, usually about, you know, in the beginning of the cycle, we'll probably have three lifting, two or three lifting days per week. And then at the end of the, the cycle, we'll have, um, you know, maybe three or four. 
Um, so it's still about 50% of the time we're going to be doing a lift in a, in a Metcon. Is that um, how many, how often a week are you assuming that people are coming in? Um, so this, this is based upon most people coming in three to five times per week, right? So, so um, the way, and the lifting days change uh, are constantly changing. So one of the things I was going to show here was a, was a quick uh, preview of sort of one of my spreadsheets that I use, one of my many spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, you can see each, each sort of uh, colored bar is a, different, um, is a different week. And then these sort of orange colored bars, these are lifting days. Now one of the things I want to point out is that we're going to do the lift about twice a week. Um, uh, and then in between those lifts, we're going to do other lifts. So we're not, we're not only doing the one lift. If, we, if you only do the one lift, people get, it gets really boring. Um, and, and it's, and it's really monotonous. And so, um, we can also lose ground on some of those other movement patterns. So if we're doing a squat as one of our, as our strength focus, we want to make sure we're still pulling and pressing and doing all the other great movements. The, uh, the, so, so you can see these orange day are the days that we lift and you'll notice that I change the days that we lift every week. So people who aren't coming, uh, you know, if, if you always have your, your leg, you know, Monday is your heavy leg day or whatever and people can't come on Monday, they're not getting a very good program because if they're not training, you know, heavy squats or, you know, uh, heavy legs, they're not, they're not on a good program. It's not a very complete program. And so this creates more uniformity for people coming on different days, you know? So, so I understand most people come on the same days each week. And so by, by changing it, I can make sure that people are getting the, the, the lifts in the right, in the right ratios. And so, so this is, this is just the last few years on this, but th I'm already down in like row for the four thousands <laughs> on this particular spreadsheet. This is, wait, this is one like continuous spreadsheet. That yeah. Just yeah. Th well, this, this one is only, I think back for the last few years, but yeah, so you can see that this just goes up and then, and then I, I eventually cut it off because, you know, I, I do go back and pull workouts regularly that we've done in the past. Um, to make sure people can be getting constant feedback. If you're always making up new workouts, the problem is, is that people, people aren't likely to log because what's the point of logging if you never repeat a workout, right? You know, um, so, so I try to repeat. Usually, you know, four or five workouts a week are workouts that we've done in the last, you know, six months or year or two years. Um, but this, this spreadsheet, I think, just goes back to 2000, let's see, 2016 maybe. Um, um, but I have one that goes from like, spreadsheet I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> never um, seen a this is just one of my many spreadsheets that goes on this long. And I, ha I actually have it going back to like 2009, 2010, um, on a, on a separate spreadsheet. So, so yeah, so I have all this data that I'm constantly updating and everything, um, and, and using algorithms to make sure that we're not missing movements, that we're not overdoing movements. Um, and this is part of the benefit of, of, of being a professional programmer is that in, in having the background that I have in engineering and project management allows me to, to use these, use these tools. Um, How long have you been doing, like you kind of started by talking about the new, um, the new strength cycle that you're going into, um, the specific structure that you use where it's kind of, it's not all on the same day every week and you, you. Um, you swap the intensity of the Metcons and the lifts and all that kind of stuff. How long have you been doing that? Like, when did you learn that lesson to, that that's the, gets the best results? So, so uh, um, well, it became through a lot of experimentation. I, I've been programming seven days a week uninterrupted since 2006. I've actually been creating workouts since 2005, but we took turns in the beginning when we first started the gym. And, and, uh, and actually, I would say it even kind of started a little bit more before that when I was experimenting. When I started CrossFit in 2004, I was doing, uh, I had to modify everything. I was doing, I was trying to do workouts in the patio of my apartment, you know? You know, I actually had like one of those, one of those uh, uh, barbells that has the screw on ends, you know? And I hung it off chains off the balcony of, of my neighbor above me. And they never said anything, which I always thought was kind of weird. But I, you know, trying to do, I couldn't do full range of motion pull-ups. I couldn't really kip and my knuckles would get bloody from rubbing on the, on the uh, stucco. And so there was just a lot of modification going on from the beginning. And then I was doing, also doing it in my, in my martial arts dojo which had very limited equipment. And so, um, but, you know, fast forward to 2006, I took over the programming full time. So, so I have not missed a day of programming in, in over 13 years. <laughs> so um, again, completely uninterrupted. I've, I've created thousands of workouts. I've, you know, collected data, like probably millions of people have done my, you know, the workouts have been done when you count the number of people and the number of workouts that, I, that I've created. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, um, but one of the other things I wanted to point out about the, uh, and this is a graphic, you can take a look at it and pause the video if you need to. Um, but uh, the other real benefit from the strength focuses, um, in addition to just, in addition to getting the routine, was, was uh, um, that beginners need to have to see the movement often enough so they can learn it. 
and I think this is a real this is a real uh, problem in a lot of a lot of CrossFit programs is they're you know they're doing the more constantly varied and these movements might come up but you know if you did power cleans a few weeks ago and the person missed it and then you did power cleans a few few weeks before that and the person missed it they might have gone three months without doing a power clean like a heavy power clean and they're going to be lost and they're going to have to teach them the power clean and so every time these movements come up as a coach we have to stop and teach the beginners and then all the more advanced people are kind of like rolling their eyes and like starting to warm up and everything and uh, that's not really good for um, for the beginners because they're always frustrated um, and then the advanced people are bored by having it show up where where again I'm programming it uh, twice a week so most people are going to get it once or twice a week you know if they really want to if they really want to get it they should come in on those two days and, and, and for the whole six weeks and they'll see huge gains at the end um, but beginners can really learn the movement and then as coaches we can give more uh, better details about about the uh, the movement. Give more specific coaching cues and things like that, and homework, you know, uh, things to help correct movement deficiencies. And like and like I said, the advanced people, because there's just enough routine, they're gonna they're gonna see PRs that maybe they haven't seen in years because they haven't ever done this style of training before. You know, so if you if you hit this lift once or twice a week for six weeks, um, you're you're likely to PR. And I, and, and I, I still get stories every single time we end a strength focus of people like regular gym members front squatting in the 400s, you know. Um, you know, when, women uh, doing a front squat, for example, who, who you know, their, their max was, was uh, uh, you know, like 165, which is a pretty good front squat for a woman, and then ending the cycle at 195, you know. And, and so that's, that's what I would consider a more mature CrossFitter, someone who's that strong, you know, but they, they can still make gains. And, and so it's pretty neat that it works kind of both sides of the bell curve. Um, and I think, again, that's one of the, that's one of the main, the, the, another one of the benefits of, of the program. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can pull up. So I mentioned coming in on, uh, coming in on those days where the lifts show up. So if I can find the right, let's see, I need to find the right graphic here now. Um, so what I do is I actually While publish. While you're looking. Um, okay. Found it. <laughs> While I'm looking, what? I was going to say that I noticed on the last spreadsheet, the 4,000 page one that, or the 4,000 line one, um, that you had all the competition games, like as far as like context coaching goes, all the competition days were on Fridays. Is that just because of the open is happening right now? So that, kind of yeah, yeah. So, so when we looked at the, the current week, it was because of the open, I, I shifted the competition or mental toughness days were going to be on Friday or Saturday, right? Um, but they, those change throughout the week, and, and I just I just published an article about the context and, and how it can be one of the one of the missing ingredients that you might not realize is messing up your programming is that you're always approaching the workouts with the same context, and there's a reason why I write you know practice context, competition context, mental toughness, and I have them all in the right in the right ratios, right? So so yeah, that was just because that was just because of the open. So you can look at the the video here. The the um, this is one of the things that I publish um, every every for every strength cycle, and it shows the days that we're doing the lifting cycle. Shows some of the recommended percentages, you know, the pre-test and the post-test. But I also include some benchmarks too. So these are benchmarks that I've used things that CrossFit's been doing for years, just because we have tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of data points um, on apps like Beyond the Whiteboard. Um, and so then again, people can can use this to sort of plan their week out a little bit, right? If if they want to make sure that they they get the the most advantage out of the front squat cycle, for example, you know, um, they they can uh, make sure they're coming in on those days specifically um, and really maximize it. Or if they if they miss a day, maybe they can do open gym and, and make it up. Um, so you would that's what we used to do in my gym was like if you missed, we expected everyone to kind of do the required lifts for the cycle. So if they did miss a day then we would want them to do it in open gym or sub it out like on a day. Like if they came in and it was Hank power cleans instead of the front box squat, then we'd say, don't do the cleans. You need to do the box squats. Like you need to get the work done on that. Um, but you would suggest otherwise to put that out ahead of time, like share that, that schedule. for the Yeah. Rest. Yeah. So for the, those of you guys um, who are, are doing the Thrive programming, you guys get this a couple weeks in advance, three or four weeks in advance. And I want you guys to publish that to like your Facebook group and then tell, tell people to screenshot it and then they can save it in their photo album and they can just reference back to it over the next, you know, five or six weeks to make sure that they, that if they really want to take advantage of that. Now I've, I've deliberately made it convoluted. <laughs> so it is, it is, instead of just posting all the workouts where then people will start to cherry pick, 
Um, uh, and you know, realistically, you guys, cherry picking is isn't um, isn't as you know that much of a problem for most people. Um, but the reality is, is that if when when left to our own devices, people will gravitate toward what they like, not what they need, right? <laughs> and so and so uh, so that's really what the problem with cherry picking is: is that if if you make it really, if you publish all your programming in advance. People will pick and choose the days that they want to come because they're, it's avoiding the things that they suck at or things that they need to work on. Um, and so that usually slows their results down. Now, it might provide a slightly better experience in their mind, but it's our jobs as coaches to educate them that they need to come and do these things that's going to make them better, you know, because ultimately, you know, it's, it's, it's the analogy of, of uh, you know, it's like having kids and, and uh, you know, having your clients dictate the programming is like having your your seven year old dictate dinner every night. You know, it's it's going to be pizza and ice cream every night, <laughs> right? And and while it'll be, the kid will be happy for a long time, you know, we know long term that is not a, a good scenario. And and so and so you know, for you guys who are who are clients or listening to this, that's part of my job is to make sure that you're that you're eating your vegetables, and then we have a very you know healthy and, and uh, diverse diverse diet of, of movements and, and workout style. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. There's also something to be said for like getting out of your comfort zone and doing the things that you don't like to do. Like there's so much mental toughness that comes along from just being like, well, I've got to do this thing and I hate doing this thing, but I've just, I know that I've got to do it. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so in, in deliberately doing things that, that, um, that you know you need to do and that you don't want to do that are hard builds character. Right. And, and, uh, um, and it does bleed over into other parts of our lives. So the, the graphic I have on the screen now is, is our 2019 calendar year. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out for you guys is that, is that, um, is that these are, again, these are planned out very deliberately, um, you know, so that we actually can get momentum into the next one. So you may have noticed um, at the end of, of 2018, the, I think it was push press and single leg deadlift. And so the push press, we then, we then turn that into a handstand push-up progression or handstand push-ups as a superset. And then the, um, the single leg deadlift helped people get better at their deadlifts. And it's, it's amazing, even in a test in a lot of people PR before they even start the cycle. And then they go on to beat that PR again at the end. You know, and, uh, um, I also wanted to point out that, you know, the superset is, is where we do a lift and then another movement and we rotate back and forth. And what we found was, was that when we were just lifting only and there was no superset, people were standing around because you have to rest, you know, two, three, four minutes between, between heavy sets so that you can recover the ATP and you can hit the next the next set and and uh, um, it was wasted time you know on a on, if you're spending 20 you know 25 minutes on a lift and you know 10 minutes of that is going to be wasted of just standing around or, or 15 minutes even um, so so what we what we started to do is incorporate the superset and what we do is this is where it's it, one of the really powerful things about this is that I can do gymnastic strength like handstand push-up progressions and weighted pull-ups and ring dips you know for pull-ups you know, what we know is that strict is healthier for the shoulders and it's better to have people train for strict before they try to learn the kipping. And so by having it as a superset, people can get, you know, for example, six weeks of pull-up progressions once or twice a week. And then all of a sudden they have pull-ups, right? Instead of just sort of having them scale them in the Metcons, right? And that's, that's usually not the best way to get someone to their, to their first pull-up. Um, and then the other thing is the unilateral movements, you know, single limb movements, um, that we that don't make a lot of sense in metcons because they don't generate the intensity that we that, that we really need to create. So you know if you had single arm dumbbell presses in a metcon, your arm's going to give out before you really get winded. Um, and so and so, uh, but but having the the single limb movements allows us to really create balance as coaches. You know those single leg deadlifts can 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 uh, tell no lies, right? So. <laughs> when you when you're watching somebody do a single leg deadlift and you start seeing them turning and they're maybe they're not engaging their lats correctly or you know all these issues or one one hip is moving completely different than the other that's a red flag and that's an opportunity for us to provide them better uh, um you know uh, coaching and be able to give them things like okay here's some stuff you can do on your own we're going to get this straightened out before you're sidelined due to an injury um, you know what i always wanted to ask you when you are like say it's the squat clean progressions right and and that's the strength focus do you also design the work to be done in the metcon to complement that lift as well so that everything that you're doing is kind of going towards that that strength focus uh i'd say more often than not it kind of depends it kind of depends but yes i mean if, if we were doing um if we're like for the squat clean focus that we're getting ready to go into um in april 
the, um, it, it, it'll be common to see the short Metcon afterward have like a power clean or a hang power clean or maybe even a kettlebell swing. You know, they're, 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 they're not exactly the same movement, but they're related. Um, and, and yeah, and the way that the way this works is, is that it's kind of like a drop set. So this is, that's an, another old school kind of training methodology where you would do your heavy sets and then you would lower the weight either once or even incrementally and do extra sets, um, to help kind of drive some more muscle development. And so, um, and I've also found that if I, if I have the, you know, let's say I have a, a you know, a squat, uh, a squat clean and, you know, we're doing, uh, I think the super set is, uh, ring weighted ring dips or ring, ring dip progressions. Um, and then the Metcon is completely different, the other movement. So it, maybe it's a, maybe it's a shoulder to overhead movement and, and all these other things. What ends up happening is you kind of paint yourself in a corner, right? You end up three or four days and I'm trying to make sure that everything matches up to the previous week and the current week, you know, and, and now I, there's no movements I can do, right? Cause we just, cause we just did everything. Right. And so now it's like literally being painted into a corner where it's like, I have nowhere to go, you know? And so, um, and so by, by, by kind of doing similar movement patterns, um, it helps. And it also helps from a coaching perspective. If, if the lift is, is done heavy and as a strength movement, and then it's done in a Metcon, um, you don't have to coach it again, right? You can just say, okay, everybody strip your bar or whatever. And now, or we're gonna do the dumbbell version for the Metcon. So same, same rules apply. Here's here are a couple slight differences. Um, and so again, it makes it easier to coach and makes the class flow much, much better. Cool. Um, but yeah, so the single limb work is, is so important, you know, single arm presses, single leg, split squats, single arm ring rows, all that stuff. So, so, but I wanted to point out to people that, that these things go into each other, you know, so you can see we're doing a dumbbell split squat and then we're going into a, a back squat, you know, and, and uh, that really helps set people up for success. And that's where the planning comes in, right? Being able to see the bigger picture and having things planned out and, and sort of, you know, setting, setting people up for success ahead of time. Um, now we are, we are doing, uh, the, a, 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 a clean focus. I know people like cringe when, when they hear the, the term squat clean, but I got to do a quick aside, you, you know, in, in the sort of CrossFit world, um, uh, we do, we have to tell people whether they're doing a power clean or a squat clean. I always think it's funny how people in the Olympic weightlifting world, they're like a clean's a clean unless it says power. And it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like. You know, it's, it's, it's true that you, do, you don't say, you know, deck clean to say that it's always from the floor, but you always say hang when it's from the hang. It's just assumed. Um, but the problem is, is, is it's kind of like uh, I actually write out kipping pull-up. I don't just write pull-up anymore because we do kipping pull-ups. We do strict pull-ups. We do chest bar pull-ups. We do weighted pull-ups. <laughs> and so I say kipping pull-up. That counts as all kipping variations. And so, you know, when I, when I uh, uh, program for CrossFitters, I'll say, squat clean squat snatch you know or power clean power snatch or whatever now for a lot of, for a lot of you guys who are going to be doing the the this clean focus um you know if a squat clean is outside of your you know uh, ability maybe maybe it's uh, uh, technique issues maybe it's uh, uh, mechanical things just do a power clean and even a partial front squat or or no or no squat you know your goal for this for the six weeks is not necessarily to lift more weight it's just to learn the movement and, and get the repetitions in that you need to learn the movement and get the timing down now, for some people, they can kind of do a squat clean, but it's, it's not pretty. Um, your goal is, again, just to smooth it out so that maybe you're doing the same weight that you tested in at at the end. And maybe now you're doing it for a couple of reps and, you know, per set, and they're beautiful. That, that's an ideal um, scenario when it comes to um, the strength focus for, for, for you. And then, of course, for people who, who've known the squat clean for a while, maybe have a few little issues, you know, we're going to try to fix those and, of course, get you stronger uh, by the end. Um, same thing goes for the ring dips. You know, it's actually, you can do ring dip or bench press. Uh, um, um, and in fact, I made it a dumbbell bench press. So if you guys, if you guys are in your gyms and you want to do a dumbbell bench press, um, talk to your coaches, find out if that's going to be okay. If you have enough benches and everything. Um, but, uh, and some people might even do barbell bench presses, but you guys, you got to understand from a programming perspective, um, the reason why we don't do two barbells as a superset is partially because gyms don't have enough barbells for everybody. Or, or for example, if you were doing, um, now the cleans are on the floor, so at least they're not using a rack. But if we were doing squats and bench press, you'd have to have two separate racks, two separate barbells for every person. You got to have enough benches for everybody. And you know, when you have classes of ten to fifteen people, that's that becomes a, a um, really really hard on the uh, gym resources. So, so that's why there's a lot of dumbbells. Um, not to mention dumbbells are just amazing for for uh, um, for developing strength and everything. The, uh, but yeah, so it's either ring. Now, if you can't do a ring dip yet, maybe you're just doing ring push-ups, and you're going to try to work toward getting your first push-up. 
right? And so this is going to be a great, if you can't do a push up on your toes yet, this is going to be a great uh, uh, cycle to focus on doing the ring push ups and adjusting the angle so you get closer and closer to the floor and uh, really trying to work on training through the, through, you know, full body tension, which is really important for, for, for push ups. And then, um, uh, you know, then it may be, but maybe you can do um, uh, uh, box steps, right? So then you can work on box steps. And then in between, maybe you just play around with some support on the rings where you hold yourself. Um, and then you can progress to, you know, deeper and deeper ring dips. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of actually partial range of motion ring dips. I'm kind of like doing them like a box squat where you set the rings where you can lock your knees and, and you're able to press out like almost like a box squat. And then the next progression is you just shorten the strap so the rings start an inch higher. And then you do all your sets at that height, you know, and you can just measure. Can you explain it. like mechanically how, like I get it, but maybe just try to take it down a couple levels, the parallel between that and a box squat? Like we're, so, Yeah, we're, so, so uh, um, one of the ways that, that uh, um, we can help train, train people is, is, to, is to require them to exert strength from a dead stop and through a partial range of motion. So the different ways you can change a movement are, are you know, you can adjust the load, you can adjust the range of motion, you can adjust the tempo, um, you can adjust the volume, how many reps in a set, you can try to go faster. You know, these are all different ways we can adjust it. And so in, in this case, instead of adjusting our body weight, right, which is, which is what you would do if you used a band or you're doing assisted somehow, um, instead of doing that, um, you're, you're going to adjust the range of motion to where most people have the strength, um, you know, at the top, it's down at the bottom where it gets hard. Well, the, 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 uh, as, as the uh, shoulder and elbow start to go all the way into their, into their full range of motion, that's where we're weakest. And by starting from a dead stop, we're actually create, uh, learning and training our muscles to create tension to be able to, to start from a dead stop at the weakest point. And so that, that's kind of like uh, um, focusing in on the area that people are going to struggle with the most. You know, I had, I had a, a number of people, um, you know, 10 years ago, uh, to trying to do ring dips and we got down to this like dental floss thin rubber band <laughs> it's like the thin the skinniest rubber band we had and they were you know they they'd strap it between the two rings and then they would put their knee in it or whatever and they could do ring dips with that little tiny band but you take away the band and they just couldn't do it and the problem is is that is that the power curve is opposite of what people need to develop the band gives the most help at the bottom where people are the weakest and that's where they need to get stronger. And then it, and then it gives it less and less help as they go up. And it's true. It matches their curve. Now, um, if you're training for powerlifting and there's, there's other accommodating resistance scenarios where that may, might make sense. Um, but in the case of something like a ring dip, um, what I found, and actually pull-ups too, you guys, when you're doing a pull-up, again, for most people, the, the, the bands have a special relationship to kipping because the kip, will, um, uh, the kip helps you get started and then you have to be able to finish. Well, the band helps you get started and then you use more and more of your strength at the top to finish. And so that's why bands kind of became sort of the default um, for a lot of, for a lot of folks for the, uh, to help them get their kipping pull-ups in it. But for developing actual pull-up strength, strict pull-up strength, bands are not, uh, not, uh, you know, the sole option. There are one, one tool that we can use, but there are many other variations. So for the ring dips though, like I said, just that little bit of assistance at the bottom prevented them from actually developing the strength that they needed. Um, without doing some other training. And then once we sort of figured that out, that's why I'm not a fan of doing a ring assisted or band assisted ring dips. Um, so stay away from that variation if you guys are going into the strength focus. So then you would do, so no bands, but you would do push ups, like ring push ups to bench to dips? Yeah, well, you could do, I would do um, ring push ups and then maybe box dips with feet on the ground, you know? Um, so, you know, you're sit sitting between two boxes. You could do one box, but it's kind of like scraping your back and all that. I like to have two boxes at the sides. And then you try to work on going all the way down. And then you can adjust the foot position, moving your feet farther out away, lifting one leg up. So you're only one leg's on the ground. And you're not pushing with your feet, but you're just resting your feet on the ground to take away some of your body weight. Always working on full range of motion as long as it's pain free. And then, um, and really, really making sure that you're tracking the, the, the elbows aren't flaring out to the side and things like that. Then usually when someone has, is able to do those, if you have fixed bars, if you have some sort of parallel bars where people can do actual ring dips, um, then you could go to that. That would be another great variation. And then we can start doing the partial range of motion. Now, when it comes to partial range of motion, it can't just be like an inch or two, right? That's, that's not going to be enough to, uh, to really start. It's going to take you a long time to get all the way down to full. You know, so if you can't do more than just a couple inches of, of range of motion, then you should stick with the, you know, the box or the parallel bar variation and do it that way.
What about using negatives? Like we used to do where you kind of, you ease yourself down and then you jump actually, up. Actually, yeah, I, sh I should have, I should have said that. So, so with the um, partial range of motion, what you're actually going to do is you start from the dead stop and then you lock out and then you do the full negative all the way down, right? So you do the eccentric portion all the way down. And, and um, that is, that is another great tool for, for developing. People are actually stronger with eccentric than they are with concentric. And so um, it also, again, helps you learn the, the, um, the technique. So they're, they're, again, the elbows and the shoulders are going in the right, you know, the right directions. And so um, that, that's, that's part of, the, of it, but negatives are great. But I do think, again, if somebody can't even do a, a slight partial range of motion ring dip, jumping up and just doing a negative isn't gonna be as beneficial as having them at least start from that, from that um, partially flexed position and then having to extend out of that. Cool. I hope you guys learned, learned a few things. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to run long if we keep talking about this stuff. As usual, you can always ask questions. And, um, and if you have more stuff you want me to talk about in the programming in this, in this podcast, then you should uh, reach out and I will try to include it. But let's talk about this, uh, this calorie thing. Um, uh, what, what, would, what did you find interesting about this article? Oh, my God, the whole article. So, um, so JJ sent me this article uh, last night. <laughs> 2 a.m. Eastern. <laughs> so I read it this morning and, and it just like pulled me in. It's a really, it's a lengthy article. It took me about 15 minutes to read through the whole thing. Um, and I have a science degree and I learned so much from this article, even though I have a science degree. And it's not that it's a sciencey article, but it's more about um, the history of the calorie as a measurement which is not something that I had ever learned about. Um, and I know that when, like, when we're talking about like food trends and diet trends and things like that, oftentimes understanding the history helps you, helps you kind of get a frame of reference for where your critical thinking should kind of fall. Like learning about the history of the food guide, for example, is a really, really important and powerful kind of frame of reference for questioning like, okay, so there's, you know, there's four food groups, which don't mirror our macronutrients. It actually mirrors like the four major agricultural groups at the time that it was, right? <laughs> like if there's lobbyists involved, right? And you can kind of be like, oh, I get it. So there's dairy farmers and they are, have very like, they, they have a lot of lobbying power. That's why they're on the fucking food group thing, right? Yeah, um, it's, like, it's like saying like, okay, we're gonna create dietary guidelines. All right, line up in order of how much money you have. <laughs> and that's exactly it. And I could see, you know, like back in, in World War One, World War Two, like that kind of time frame when it was first established, people were poor and you needed to look after farmers. And, and you know, it's either it's either tell people to eat their food or subsidize them. Either way, it's going to cost you. Right. And we didn't have the same kind of people were malnourished back then, not overnourished like they are now. So you didn't have to deal with the same type of it was more about increasing your calories, which this article also talks about. It's more about getting the minimum calories as opposed to, you know, what's too many. Um, so I don't, they probably didn't think, well, if we don't do this properly, we're going to end up with an obesity epidemic because at the time people were starving. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And so this article is from the economist. I'll put a link in the show notes and, and uh, you know, to, to kind of break it down, because it's kind of a longer read. You can skip some of it. It's kind of telling the story of a specific person who, in the end of it, I didn't even realize. I don't want to ruin the surprise. I was surprised at the end. They kind of dropped a little thing about his, his training in, in uh, San Diego. But, but uh, um, you, you know, didn't know that? I, th I thought that that was probably how you got, like, connected into it. No, no, I just, like, I just read articles like this all the time. <laughs> I thought it was really cool. I was like, oh, here we go. This is how it connects to everything. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh <laughs> But basically, the, the, what, uh, it, was, it was right before the French Revolution, there was this French scientist who, who thought, okay, like, we're eating our food, we need oxygen. If I burn the food, it uses oxygen, so it must be a similar process, like a furnace. And so he created this little glass uh, um, calorimeter now, that now they're called, and you'd put a certain amount of food in there, and then they would, they would uh, um, light it on fire, and they would measure how much, how much heat it gave off. And they would say, okay, so this is a calorie and cal calor is a Latin for heat. And so, um, and then um, he was starting that sort of process. And then what happened, Gigi? And then he got beheaded. <laughs> he, got be <laughs> he got put in the guillotine. Um, probably because people were like, oh, do you realize what you've done? You're going to make so many people neurotic about eating calories. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> Man. So um, funny though, when I read that part, I was like, no way. And then I had to research the guy 
Lavoisier. Yeah. Um, Anton Lavoisier mm -hmm. and and I read through his whole like backstory and everything and so this guy also helped contribute to the metric system so I don't know if like it doesn't mean as much in the states because you guys have your own number system whatever but one calorie is the amount of heat it takes to increase one milliliter of water one degree celsius so there's, I think that that's something that probably Americans don't have an appreciation for, but everything in the metric system is interrelated. Um, so it's got all of these like, like one milliliter of water is, is one centimeter cubed, which is one um, yeah, yeah. gram, right? Like, and which it takes one calorie. It, it makes the math, you guys, it makes the math so much easier when you're, when you're doing equations and calculating things. But, but um, I was a thermodynamics major as an engineer. And so thermodynamics is a study of energy and heat, heat transfer and so calories were, were, were definitely used um, and then there's also BTUs British thermal units and things like that and they, they are all related but that's what's the beauty, beauty of the metric system is is that it's so much it makes the math so much easier but yeah, um, like unfortunately your body doesn't run on the metric system <laughs> well and your body doesn't there's no fire inside of you literally <laughs> you know burning the food for energy and so um, and so that's where that's where we already started kind of going off off the rails <laughs> so um, <laughs> And, and, uh, and then, and that's where these measurements came from. Now, one thing I will say though, is it, at least it's a measurement, you know, at least it gives us some feedback, um, about, you know, the, the food we're putting in our bodies and, and if we can change it, then we can see what the effect is later. And so that's really one of the, one of the key, the key points about this. It's like having, if your bathroom scale is off by 10 pounds, but at least it's consistent, <laughs> yeah. you can still measure progress. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it tells you you're 10 pounds heavier or 10 pounds lighter, as long as it, a pound is still a pound or whatever, or a kilo is still a kilo. <laughs> you make fun of America. You guys still use pounds though, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then, so it's, it's interesting that you say that cause that's kind of the next spot where things went off the rails, right? So first is this very, very archaic kind of measurement system that was done by literally lighting shit on fire. And like, <laughs> like that's always not, my solution. When I don't, when I don't know what to do. I don't know. Burn it. <laughs> burn it. See what it does. So like, you can imagine. Like, obviously, we know. Like, if you put something into a frying pan, the more fat it has, the hotter, the hotter it burns, right? So that's where these are like really basic concepts that we know now that they were just discovering two hundred years ago. So okay, so they discovered this thing called the calorie, right? And it, all it was was a unit of measurement. So like you said, fine, as long as that unit of measurement stays consistent. It doesn't matter what the direct causation or correlation of the existence of that measurement is. It's like, okay, this is just what we're going to use. We don't know how we get from A to Z, but as long as that A to Z is consistent, then we're fine. So where we go off the rails again is that A to Z is not consistent at all. Not so, what's so for example, I think they discovered that, uh, you know, a carbohydrate and a protein both provide four calories per gram of when you burn it and then, and then fats 8.9, they rounded it up to nine. Um, so they just, you know, fat has a lot more calories, but the difference is the way your body absorbs those calories. So carbohydrates are absorbed more readily. Certain carbohydrates are absorbed even easier. Um, protein is absorbed more slowly, but it also uses energy when it's, when it's burned for energy. And uh, same thing with fat. Fat's absorbed a lot more slowly because the body has to tease apart the different and, and convert them to fatty acids. And so, uh, so it's a lot more complex than that. I, I do like the other experiment. I, you know, when you read into it, there was about, a, I guess it was about 100 years later or something like that. The, um, I can't remember his name right now, but he, was, he, he put people, this is, this is pretty advanced for the time, into a room that was uh, six feet high. I think he said, I think it was four feet wide and seven yeah. feet long. Basically a tiny box with walls that had water in between them, steel walls that had water in, in, there, in between them. And he stuck them in there for 14 days. And they, um, everything that they were given was measured. It was the exact food that they were given. These were all volunteers, by the way. They weren't like prisoners. Uh, <laughs> but, um, which they probably could do. But uh, and I think about the metabolic ward studies. I'm like, why don't we just get the prisoners to volunteer for these metabolic ward studies? Give them exact, exactly the right food. They keep them in a sealed room and measure out, you know, measure everything. Um, but the idea, the idea was they give them the exact foods and then they measured how much heat this person generated and they, they had to lift weights sitting down in the room and stuff. Um, and they basically just hung out 14 days and then even the, their waste was then collected and then burned <laughs> to measure the caloric content of the waste, which is, which again is, is a pretty, 
pretty advanced for the time, but you know, most of the, the waste that comes out of you, most of your poop is actually bacteria that has digested some of your food and, and prolificated, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's bacteria that is multiplied that is coming out of you. And, um, and that back, some of that bacteria is good and it produces um, things that are beneficial for our body. Some of it breaks down things that we wouldn't normally digest. And so it's really fascinating. Um, you know, I really liked, uh, I think it was John Berardi or maybe it was, um, uh, maybe it was Polkin who said that like, you, you're, you are not what you eat, you are what you absorb, right? And I think a lot of people need to understand that, that um, just because it says it, uh, you, know, you know, that it was this many calories or had this many proteins or carbs or whatever, um, doesn't mean you're going to absorb it. And so that really has to do with gut health and, and uh, your digestive system. You know, one of the statistics that's said on here is sometimes people's uh, um, uh, intestinal length can vary. Some people have a 50% longer intestine than somebody else, right? It's just, just, just in genetic variation. It's crazy. But um, uh, so it's really, it's really interesting with, the, with like the absorption thing. So they also talk about how if you actually let the toast cool, it, it actually gives you less calories. <laughs> If you, um, if you, if you take your, your pasta and let it cool and then reheat it, it actually is less calories than if you ate it right when you first made it. You and absorb my, less calories. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite if one. On fire, it would still give you the same amount of calories. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. My favorite one was the rice thing they did in 2015 where right. they found that if you cooked rice with a little bit of olive or uh, coconut oil, mm -hmm. let it cool then um, a lot of the, the starches convert to a starch that you can't absorb. I think it's resistant starch. And so, uh, but I might be mistaken, but uh, which is actually good for, for gut health. But, uh, uh, and so you, you, it was actually 50% less calories uh, um, and less carbohydrates if you, if you cooked it with coconut oil, let it cool, and then either ate it cold or reheated it. Um, so I thought that was really fascinating. But it just goes back to this whole ca calorie concept and, how, and how, um, uh, how much error there is, margin of error. You know, it's like the thing I have on the screen right now, it says labels on food may underestimate their calories by up to 20%. And in some foods, they were finding the 70%. And they usually underestimate because of what Gigi mentioned earlier was a lot of this stuff was created uh, when they were worried f much more about mal uh, malnourishment. And they just want to make sure people were hitting at least a certain amount of calories so they didn't starve. And so companies, when they, when they put their... Um, stuff on their labels, they were told to kind of make sure that they were like overcompensating a little bit. And of course, now it plays to the, the food, the food market where people are always, you know, conscious about calories. And so they're, if they, if they're going to, if they can label it has less calories than there actually is, that's going to look good for them. Right. And so, um, and so usually it's about 20% off. <laughs> so if you're wondering why you're, you know, your Fitbit or whatever, and you know, and is not matching up, you're like, I've been eating like, you know, 800 calories less than I'm burning and I'm not, I'm not losing weight. Well, it's probably because, um, uh, it's probably because these food labels are off. Not to mention those, those, those me measuring things are also, there's a lot of error there as well. Yeah. There's also something to be said for like, you know, the work that was done on the original, the original studies on the calorie, like they're using real food, right? They didn't have all these additives and chemicals and, and, you know, the only preservatives that they had back then was salt, you know, um, and, and now you think about like, if you lit something on fire, that is like, I keep going back to this letting go to fire thing. I just love it because it's so non-scientific now in this day and age. And like back then it was probably like, I did it in oh. high school chemistry. That's how, that's when I first learned about it. We had to, we had to like come up with an experiment burning food and, and doing it ourselves. Yeah. So have you ever tried to burn margarine? No. You can't burn margarine. Ooh, interesting. It melts, but it doesn't burn. Hmm. So, so then, Let so me. now we have all of these like foods and I'm using that term like loosely, like from a factory, right? So these things from a factory that you put in your body that you can't even burn. And it's like, well, this has so many calories and it's like, okay. But even if we're going back to the very first, like, this is how we determine what calories are, you would say, well, it has zero calories because it doesn't burn. It doesn't let off any heat because you can't light it on fire. And back then they probably would have been like, oh, maybe we shouldn't eat that, you know? But we're just like, oh, we'll just eat these Cheetos and the Cheetos is something else that doesn't burn. Hmm. But like, um, 
these things that don't burn me because they have so much chemicals in them, like it kind of, when you relate it back to calories and things. Yeah, and how are they coming up with the calorie counts for those if they don't, if, if they don't burn? And, and, and I don't know the exact science behind that stuff, but like I said, this is all, there's just a huge margin of error. And so people get really specific on their, if they're weighing and measuring their food, which I think some people, you know, if you are concerned about your health and you're trying to change your weight, gain weight or lose weight, there should be some periods of time where you're actually weighing, so you can get a real understanding of what a serving is or how much, how much you're actually eating. But like I said, going back to the original thing, you know, calories are important. If you are trying to lose weight, it, you do need to have a calorie deficit. That's, that's not, that's just the way the, the world works. Um, so, so, but now, now it's much more nuanced than that when you think, look at macronutrients and food timing and all these things. But, uh, but ultimately, you know, don't get so caught up in the calorie counts. It's more of just a general average, right? So, you know, as long if you, if you're, if you're, um, trying to lose weight and, and, you know, your app or whatever says you need to eat 1800 calories. You know, if you can try to make that the average over, over a period of, of a week, um, you're going to, you know, so one day you're high, but the next day you're a little low, you're, you're on the right track. Um, if you're not, if your weight's not changing, then again, you might need to sit down and think, okay, let me try knocking my calories down a little bit more, you know, um, um, relative to what I was doing. Again, it doesn't matter that there, that there is a lot of error, but I just think that a lot of people get really, um, you know, neurotic about the calorie counts and you have to understand 20%, you, you know, you guys, 20% of 2000 is 400 calories, right? So like, you know, people get really nitpicky with their, with their weighing and measuring their calorie counts. And it's like, it's not that, it's not that critical, you know, as long as you're, as long as you're documenting everything and you're being consistent with the way you measure things. Um, don't be so freaked out about, you know, the calories, as long as you're generally eating less calories, you're going to, you're going to, uh, you know, burn some fat. Yeah. And even if, you know, you don't, it's not just about the measuring and the weighing. It's also about like keeping the way that you cook it the same and keeping, and one of the other things the article talked about is that there's going to be different caloric absorption based on if you fry something or if you heat it in the oven or if you microwave it and those will all give you different rates of absorption like the and the difference is like staggering like literally like 20 to 90 percent absorption rate which if you're looking at 100 calories worth of rice absorbing 90 percent of that versus 20 percent that's a yeah, lot. Yeah, I think I think like sweet potatoes were like or steak was like 15 percent the more done versus like rare or uncooked you know, same thing like sweet potatoes, like 40%, you absorb 40% more of the sweet potato, but I'm like, who eats raw sweet potatoes? <laughs> My baby does. It's, it's funny that you should ask. It's raw? Eric totally just ate a raw sweet potato yesterday. I was cutting him <laughs> up and he was like, he's in his high chair and he's watching me and he kept being like, eh, eh. And finally I was like, fine, just take one. You're going to figure it out. Like it's not cantaloupe. I know it looks like cantaloupe, which he loves. <laughs> but he's just like, he fully ate the whole thing and had this disgusted look on his face the entire time that's so funny <laughs> yeah like, that's hilarious what are you doing <laughs> it's funny yeah anyway. yeah and so that to, to your point <laughs> that, but to your point like again uh, um being aware of some of those things will help you know don't get too don't get too uh, uh caught up in in the calories stuff you know i'm i'm definitely more on the you know eat whole foods you know, eat, eat uh, as much as you can try to avoid processed stuff only, you know, make it more of a treat or when you're, when you're, um, you know, for special occasions. Um, and, and then, and then the next stage is to start looking at kind of your macro content, right? So most people need a hundred plus grams of protein per day. You know, if you're trying to lose weight, you're probably going to want to be around, you know, 150 grams of carbs or less really lower for the lower car people who tolerate lower carb wells, usually, usually the right way to go. And then the rest of the calories are sort of filled with sort of healthy fats, right? And so that's, that's one of the, I think, the, is a general starting point, but everybody needs to, to tweak the dials. You know, one thing I will say that's great about all these apps and, and all the science that we know now is it allows us to customize to our genetics and our, and our, and our tastes and our lifestyle. And we can tweak these dials and, you know, oh, I'm feeling, I'm, you know, I'm feeling really tired and, and all the time. It's like, okay, well, maybe we need to up your carbs a little bit. You know, oh, I'm, you know, um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm hungry all the time, you know, especially at this certain time. Well, maybe we need to up your fat because that'll make you feel more full. Oh, I'm not losing weight. Well, let's, let's take your total calories down. And it's just, it's just these little tweaks um, that can really make sure that you're, you know, making progress towards your goals. But again, it, do, it doesn't have to be this like super scientific because like I said, the reality is, is that the calorie is not super scientific. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the best thing that you can do is just keep it as consistent as possible and don't worry if it's correct or not, right? Like, the or exact. Don't worry if it's exact. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry if it's exact. It doesn't need to be accurate. It just needs to be precise. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and then the other thing is that it, it's easier than you think because, you know, we're saying like, oh, just keep it consistent. And as long as you're always assuming, making the same assumptions every single day, if you think like, well, but all the different foods that you eat and it's all going to have different stuff. It's not true. Most people eat the same 10 or 15 meals. That's it. Like yeah. On, re on repeat. Yeah. On repeat. Exactly. Right. Like very rarely are you going to have like something totally new that you just have no idea about. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so just switching something out instead of switching out the potatoes for some sort of vegetable, you know, um, you know, cutting out some of the sweetened drinks, um, um, trying to eat, you know, trying to eat a, a, a bunch of protein with each meal, you know, especially breakfast, which for a lot of people, because it's, it's hard to have good, rarely sourced healthy protein because you have to cook it. It's, it's usually, it's usually hard to have protein in the morning. You know, these small changes, uh, um, and, and I wouldn't to try to necessarily try to do all those at once, but, but doing incrementally making these small changes and not necessarily being so concerned about the exact calories, uh, um, I think is, is way more beneficial than, than trying to, like I said, trying to like, you know, do these very specific calorie things. There, I just remember the other one, there was another person he mentioned in here. It was about weighing himself like before and after pooping and stuff. And it's just like the dangling scale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, I, people do that, right? Like they're obsessed with, you know, all their, their weight and how much they pooped and all this stuff. And you're like, Oh, you, that doesn't matter. Like it's, it's not that, that that's really not important compared to these huge, you know, low hanging fruit, the stuff that's really going to make change. That's it for today, guys. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Gigi? Oh, so much more, but we should stop. <laughs> this is going to be like our record for the longest episode so far, I think. Um, as usual, you guys, thanks for joining us. Um, um, if you're listening in, check out the video on YouTube. If you're watching this and you, in, on YouTube and you want to hear it, you can listen to it on, on Anchor. There'll be a link in the description. And uh, um, I'll see you guys in the next video.